You know, one of the lines in the song that we just sang, the first song, Nin Rudiram Adinal Pradishita Jeeva Puduvariyai. By the blood of Jesus, He has made a new way. And that's the series that we're in the new and living way. Those who have their trust in the Lord will say, Amen. 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 They will say, Lord, we can't wait to see you face to face. Please come quickly. Amen. Amen. So we're in this series called The New and Living Way. The New and Living Way. And we're specifically in this topic of the new family. The new family. We've talked about the new covenant, the new birth, the new heart, the new fruit, and now we're in the new family. And for about the last month, we've been going through the various aspects of this new family. We talked about the church as our spiritual family. Then last week, Justin talked about the husband and wife relationship from Ephesians chapter 5. And today, we will talk about the parent-child relationship from Ephesians chapter 6. So as you're going to Ephesians chapter 6, let me, by way of introduction, say that raising children, the days are long, but the years are short. That's a common saying that we hear. You know, if you ask a mother, at the end of the day, they're so tired and they're uh, doing so much for their kids, but before you know it, they are out of the house or they're in college or they're married, and it's just a few years you have with your children to mold them into who they ought to be. So as Christian parents, we have a duty and we have a responsibility to raise our children in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Many of you uh, growing up, I know I heard this when I was still a child in India, and I know that this is uh, a story but I know that uh, many of the young people here might read uh, Aesop's fables, moral stories that you might read about. I'm uh, reminded of a story that I heard of a local boy who got involved in criminal activities, including stealing, and eventually that led to murder. And he was put in prison and placed on death row, having his hands bound behind him and led away to the place of public execution. His mother followed closely behind in the crowd, violently beating her breast in sorrow. On the day of his lethal execution, the boy's last request was that he be allowed to say some words to his mom. And he was granted that request. And when his tearful mom came close to him, the boy asked uh, that she bend down a little bit closer to speak into her ears a little bit of a secret. She moved closer and put her ears close to her son's mouth so that he can whisper something into his ear. The boy made this calculated move and he bit off his mother's ear. He then proceeded to tell her, if you have corrected me all those times I did wrong, you had been more strict and disciplining me in, instead of allowing me to have my own way, I would not be here on death row today and ready to be executed, mom. In fact, you, if you had disciplined me, I would not become a criminal and I would, not have lear I would have learned to respect others, their property and their life. You know, as parents, parenting is one of the greatest privileges we have uh, at, at the same time, it's one of the most challenging tasks we have. As Christian parents, our highest calling is to make disciples of our children. In our homes, there are these souls that need to be saved, and that is our very own children. And discipleship starts with being a living witness of truth to your children, giving a testimony of the gospel and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to our children by the way we live, by the words we say. Then when the Lord works in their heart and they make a choice to follow the Lord and they start to uh, accept the Lord as their personal savior, it is our job to make them disciples. We need to be disciple makers in the home 
and teach them the word by our action and, and but by, by showing them what we treasure above everything else. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, lays out some important truths that we need to study. What does it say? Let's read it all together. And then I have a demonstration here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. See, this honor and father and mother, uh, honor your father and mother is part of the Ten Commandments, the fifth of the Ten Commandments, and the first one with a promise attached to it. It's also a repetition of what is happening in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, I have two items here. Can somebody tell me what these are? Everybody knows what these are, right? In Malayalam, we call them padavalenya. Or in uh, English, I think it's snake cord. What's the difference between the two? What's that? Josiah, one is curved, right, very good. You want to come up here for me? If you, if you want to volunteer, or Luke, Luke, you want to come up? No, okay, Josiah. Can you make this straight for me? Guess what happened? It broke. It can't be made straight. It's available for auction later. to teach our children while they're still young they're malleable because if we don't tie a string of a rock to the bottom of that what happens it becomes bent and it goes the wrong way and when they're a past a certain age it is impossible to make them straight without breaking them without breaking them amen so we're in the study of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 through 4 but I was studying this, the first word that it says is, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is right. There's not much of a choice here. This is the right thing to do. Children, obey your parents. And, this, and the portion that came to my mind quickly is when prophet, and, uh, prophet Samuel told something to King Saul, the first king of Israel. Right? We, ha we know the story very well from Samuel. We know that Samuel was told, uh, told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I asked my kids what that meant, and they didn't know it in its full context, so I thought maybe I should bring that up as the first point here. Prophet Samuel confronted Saul, and he was told by God first, by the prophet, that you should destroy your enemy, the Amalekites, and you should destroy them utterly, completely. And instead, Saul went to battle with them, and he took uh, back some of the uh, good cattle, some of the good animals, and said he's going to do uh, worship with them, or he's going to sacrifice them. And then when Samuel comes back, we see that he starts to hear uh, the noise of all these animals. And he says, uh, Saul immediately says, I have carried out the Lord's instruction. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. And when Samuel heard these animals, he said, then what is the noises that I'm hearing? And then Saul starts to blame others and justify himself. And we see that Saul was cut to the heart when Samuel the prophet said, the Lord, uh, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So Samuel here was saying, uh, goes on to say that disobedience or rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, of divination. And that he, he says that disobeying God is rebellion against him. And Samuel was calling out the king, the first king of Israel, uh, by the power of the Lord to say that you have done wrong. 
You did not obey fully what the Lord had told you. Yes, you went and battled them and you got the victory, but you did not follow fully. And that is the, the case that I want to lay before you. Many times when we do not obey the Lord fully, we end up with the downstream effects or the consequences of not obeying the Lord. And uh, then we have to deal with all of that as different uh, problems throughout our life. Here we know that Saul was taken out as king and that David was anointed in his stead. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus replied and said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and will come to them and make a home with them. So the, the obedience to the word of God, especially as a child of God, is of extreme importance. Uh, the uh, word of God is clear in many different scriptures. If you would put up those uh, scripture portions, that clearly tells us about the various uh, raising children is clearly in the word of God. I have the slide for that. Um, so let me... The title that I've given this sermon is The Olive Shoots and the Arrows. The Olive Shoots and the Arrows. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents, for this is pleasing to the Lord. And we see that three times in the Bible, it's repeated the fifth of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 12, the next portion, verse 2, says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days will be long on the land that the Lord is giving you. So the children of Israel were told this. And then again in Deuteronomy, it is repeated, honor your father and your mother and uh, as the Lord your God commanded you, and you will live long and a full life in the land the Lord is giving you today. And in the New Testament, Apostle Paul is reminding, uh, uh, reminding us to the Ephesian church that, that we need to honor our father and our mother. So that was the second portion. First, though, let me go back and say we need to be obedient to our parents in the Lord. And so there is, in Christian families, there is this particular, uh, if you want to call it, biblical order, biblical order of the family. So the head of our families is, we think, the husband, but it's really Christ. Christ is the head of our house. And everything that the husband does should be under the umbrella of Christ. So if your father or mother tells you to do something that is against the word of God, it is not something that you ought to follow. But if it is according to the word of God, you do need to follow it, right? Last week, uh, Brother Justin talked about how the husband ought to love uh, his wife. And then the wife needs to respect her husband. That was in Ephesians chapter 5. There's three things that the husband needs to be pros at, right? Protecting the family, providing for the family, and be a pro at leading the family. And the wife is supposed to be the comforter, the teacher, and the nurturer in the household. So under this umbrella of Christ, husband and wife, comes the children. And the children ought to obey their parents, and they are to love their parents. So obedience just doesn't come overnight. There has to be a relationship that is built up. A love that needs to take place from the moment that they are born. Uh, you are nurturing them and building them up in the ways of the Lord. And then they will naturally want to obey the parents, right? Parents role modeling submission. You know, I was taken to uh, the portion in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, where uh, it says that we ought to obey. And specifically, let me go to Hebrews chapter 12. where it talks about how the father, my son, do not, verse uh, 6 or 5 onwards, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. When the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son, endure hardship as disciples, God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined, 
and everyone, if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You're an illegitimate child. Not, no true sons or daughters will not be disciplined. And again, the word of God is clearly saying that we, if you spare the rod, you are spoiling the child. And the word of God clearly says that we are to bring up your children in the ways of the Lord. And we'll get to that in verse 4. But I think there's a difference between discipline and punishment. There's a clear difference between discipline and punishment. If you're punishing your child out of anger uh, while you're still angry at them, then, you know, DHS might get called, cops might come in. But there's a difference between that and disciplining, right? Disciplining is to train for correction and maturity, not because you want to inflict pain for something that they did wrong. There is also discipline where you're thinking about their future and not about their past misdeeds. You're trying to train them in the ways that they need to go, like the padavalanya that has a string or a varak at the end, right? Discipline is what the Word of God teaches us. It says it's out of love and concern as part of the parent. There is a security and there's a love, and the child knows that through discipline that the father and the mother the parents who are punishing them have a reason for it. And then if this is built in the proper relationship, discipline, although it is not never good when it happens, the, the, there is a joy and a love that is included in that. Amen. Amen. Um, so let me uh, have some practical uh, points here. But before that, let's go on to verse four. Verse four is very curious. And it is something that uh, is very hard uh, to uh, level, right? Because there's two things that are kind of tense or against each other. Um, and what does it say? Fathers, do not provoke. So that word provoke your, uh, your children to anger. Exacerbate is another uh, word that is used. But at the same time, you need to discipline. You need to give them instruction. So how is that possible? Usually when you discipline them or give them instruction, they usually get mad or they might not, at the moment, not like it. So how do you do it where you're not provoking your child? You need to know the very frame of your child. You need to know what is the things that they can handle. And then you know that you uh, are disciplining them and giving them instruction in the Lord, not giving them punishment uh, to the level that they are not able to handle it. So there's particularly two words. One is that word discipline that is used. The word discipline is uh, uh, the Greek word, uh, and it's very similar to a word that is in Malayalam, uh, um, I want to say, but it's not, it's not related. Paideia, training or lessons, instructions, discipline. It's the Greek word that is used to uh, train someone physically or mentally uh, in a way to produce maturity out of them so that they can be harmonious uh, and that they could be developed, right? That's the word that is used in instruction or paideia. So the end goal of Christian training is to mature, educate, and strengthen your child to mold them into the likeness of Christ, it is not so much for their education or for wealth or anything else, but really for them to be molded into the likeness and the, and the uh, holiness of Christ. So spiritual discipleship is to uh, a continual process where we're converting them uh, into true disciples. And God wants trustworthy, obedient, and joyful children in training, instruction, or discipline. That's paideia. Then there's another word that is the second word that is used, which is nusthesia. Nusthesia. That's the Greek word. It has the meaning of warning or direction or admonition. It is uh, admonition with a warning. And just like you have a manual uh, for any thing that you have to build, there is a manual for us, which is the Bible, the Word of God. We have to be bringing them up in the admonition and the counsel and the warning of the Word of God. It conveys an idea that we are to 
uh, continue to train them up and give them uh, advice and tell them about what are the dangerous consequences of their action. It is by word of encouragement and uh, reproof. So when you combine these two words, paideia and nusthesia together, you see that, uh, that we are to do those things, but at the same time, not by provoking or exacerbating their children. This is hard for us to do as parents, if you admit it. Um, and so it is the word of God that clearly says we do not need to provoke them, but in love, we need to continue to work with them. So let's look at some practical asp aspects of this and how this is possible. So the family is supposed to be uh, the discipleship centers of our home where children are uh, sanctified to be more Christ-like and be an example uh, from their parent and learn their an example from their parents we're uh, encouraging parents to impress upon the hearts of the children the genuine love uh, for the word of god and by doing life together they have a small unit or a community in their family that they're able to uh, see how the love of god works amen so uh, i think there's many aspects of that that we can go into uh, children need to recognize that parents are an authority and God is the creator and Bible is a roadmap. Children also need to know that there is a mother and a father who love, to get, uh, love each other and work together as a team. Uh, they need a full gospel church, as we heard in Sunday school this morning, uh, a strong Sunday school and a truth teaching pastor, and they need a discipline, uh, instruction and training from their parents. With all of this said, how is this possible in practical ways? We want to be role models to our kids, and we say uh, we are not perfect human beings. Even as parents, your parents don't have it all together. They're not perfect. And uh, many times what we show forth to them is not exactly everything that we say. And hypocrisy is one of the worst things. We don't want to say, do as I say, but not as I do. Amen? So uh, children need to understand, just as we sang in all of those songs, that it is only by the grace of God that the parents are also saved, that there is no uh, a perfect person on this earth. Even parents can make mistakes, and that they need to show the same grace that was shown in the new family, where the grace of the Lord came down and uh, enveloped them. And that's where it says, in the Lord. Be obedient to your parents in the Lord. When it says in the Lord, that means that Jesus Christ uh, left his glories above and he came down into this earth for each one of us. And that servant leadership of Christ is the example uh, that we need to show. And the grace that the parents are able to experience, even when they make mistakes, the children are able to see and they're, they're able to emulate that. We need to show a lot of grace to each other in loving forgiveness. So uh, we need to, con it's a process that is continual and that, that parents sometimes even need to ask forgiveness of their children. And it is, not, it is not a sign of weakness. Yes, let me repeat that. Sometimes the parents need to ask forgiveness of their children when they are uh, not showing uh, true Christ nature in their life. Uh, when they are uh, messing up in front of their children, it is appropriate to uh, have them see you asking forgiveness of the Lord and asking forgiveness of the people around you. That shows a sign of true humility and genuine care and is able to build that relationship so your child uh, is able to see that as a model. Don't hold grudges, especially between uh, parents and children. If both sides are willing to forgive each other and give each other many, many chances, you will have a two, true confidant as they grow up and you, they will be uh, also children of God in this crooked and perverse generation. You know, the title of my sermon was Olive Shoots and Arrows. There's two specific Psalms that I'll take you to. First, I'll take you to Psalms 128, verse 1 through 4. You know, you might hear when babies are still small that, you know, she's got her daddy's smile or her mommy's lips. 
you know, babies, toddlers, there's comparisons made. No parent wants to hear that they have no resemblance of you, right? Parents smile, parents' lips or their nose, different ways that things are compared to. But as they get older, the comparison is towards the character or the quality of the parent, right? It, they start to say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or like father, like son, or like mother, like daughter. So the next generation ought to reflect the qualities of the previous generation. And Psalms 128 reminds us, the blessings of a man who fears the Lord and walks in obedience with him. Psalms 128, verse 1 through 4, it specifically says that there will be a fruitful wine and olive shoots around your table. Many times we don't even have time to sit together to eat around a table. And it doesn't say fruitful wine and poison ivy. It says fruitful wine and olive shoots. What's so special about olive shoots and the wine? So when I studied that, it said the shoots tend to grow around the original tree. You know, children springing up around the, the parents in a healthy way. Looking at the example of the parents. You know, if the roots are healthy, there will be shoots that come up and vice versa, right? If the father does not fear the Lord or does not walk in his ways, the children will have an anemic spiritual life. Or if the roots are rotten, there will be no shoots that come out in a spiritual sense. So there will be a fruitful wine, which makes people glad. And there is olive or olive shoots. So that is a blessed, spiritual, healthy family. And that is uh, what it says, you shall eat the fruit of your labor. Blessing and prosperity shall be yours. That's the olive shoots. And then it says in Psalms 127, verse 3 through 5, the arrows in your quiver. Arrows in your quiver. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Amen. Here, this specifically, uh, what spoke to me was it talks about a multi-generational vision. I'll take the example of Timothy. And Paul speaks to that and he says, I see the same faith, the sincere faith that I saw in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, in you, my spiritual son, Timothy. At a young age, Timothy was taught the Jewish scriptures. And after uh, the Messiah showed up, Jesus, they tried to continue to train Timothy in the things of Christ. And there was a sincere faith later, many years later, Paul is saying in a powerful testimony to the pastor of the church in Ephesus that, that there is an eternal impact made by the grandparents and the mother, the grandparents and the parents. So in our homes is the perfect lab, the perfect situation to make disciples. And they are growing, uh, seeing how we behave, how we act. If we're lying or if we're making up things or if we're not walking in the ways of the Lord, then they will pick up on that quickly. And uh, there needs to be a multi-generational vision. So Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it might go well with you and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As I'm concluding here and the worship team is coming up, uh, one of the songs that spoke to me uh, is Talking to Jesus by Elevation Music and Maverick City. It came out just within the last year. Some of you might have heard this song. Worship team, come on up. But pay attention as well. Grandma used to pray out loud by her bed every night. To me, it sounded like mumbling, like she was out of her mind. She said, boy, this kind of praying is what saved my life. You ought to try it sometimes. And now I know she was right. 
She was talking to Jesus. She was talking to Jesus for all of her life, and she's no longer here. Mama used to drag me to church Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, khaki pants and polo shirt. I used to put up a fight, but she said, son, one day you'll thank me for having God in your life. And I know she was right. Mama was right, because now I'm talking to Jesus and she's got me talking to Jesus. Yes, my mama was right, because I'm talking to Jesus, and I love talking to Jesus, and I'll be talking to Jesus for the rest of my life. The next line goes on to say, now I have a few of my own, and I'm trying to raise them up right. My oldest is 15, and I remember what that was like, trying to deal with all the drama, trying to figure out all of life's question, and I've been looking for a way to show him how to make it all right. The other day, he came into my room while I was saying my prayers. And he said, I'll come back later. I see that you got a lot on your mind. And I said, no, it's not an interruption, son. You couldn't have picked a better time because I'm talking to Jesus. Come on over and give it a try. And we started talking to Jesus together. And now he's talking to Jesus. Thank God he's talking to Jesus. I hope he's talking to Jesus for the rest of his life. Amen. There's no wrong way to do it. There's no bad time to start. It may not sound pretty, just like what's on your heart. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Just talk to your father like you are his kid. Just start talking to Jesus. You can talk to Jesus whenever you like. You can start talking to Jesus for the rest of your life. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, the cross, too much for words. When he shed his blood on the cross for me, he built a new way for me. And in that new way is a new family. And it is not just my God. It is the God of my forefathers and is the God of my next generation. Amen. Oh, I wish you would understand that, that this is a God of generations after generations. I believe Psalms 20 is uh, what we read this morning, right? Psalms uh, 19. And it says, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The Word of God is our guide, and with the Word of God as our guide, each and every generation, we should continue to train in the ways of the Lord. May God bless you all with these words.